Well, thank thank you, Panos, and thank you the, to the society for having me. It's been an amazing week. And I'm going to talk about the interplay between informal networks and formal markets. And the ideas here are twofold. I mean, it's no loss to the people in the society that uh, networks have consequences. They control flow of information. They control people's participation. Um, they're play roles and, and things like polarization and diffusion and contagions. And uh, they're also shaped by the institutions that they affect. So they can be changed by markets and they can be changed by platforms and other things. And I think one thing that we need to better understand as scientists uh, are how networks are impacted by the, their surroundings and what kind of feedback and dynamics they have. And so here today I'm gonna do um, cover two pieces of research that have been done mostly in the field. One is how informal networks can best be used to spread information. So this was how we started on this project some, well, I guess almost a decade ago. Um, and so here, how can networks help in spread, spreading the, the take up of formal loans? And then the second question will be, once people get those loans, how does that change the networks that they're involved in? So how does access to a market, in this case, um, formal credit, change the informal networks and behavior of people in a society? So here in terms of what, uh, complex systems, we're gonna have a feedback between the informal structure of the social fabric in, in the society and the workings of the formal markets that they're involved in. And so piece one comes from work um, with Abhijit Banerjee, Arun Chandra Sikhar, and Esther Duflo, that started in 20, 2006 um, and was published first in a paper in 2013 and then another paper, follow-up paper in 2019. And this piece is how do informal networks affect the spread of information? How do they affect the, the take up of, of loans? And I'm gonna start with some background of that. So um, we were working with a bank that was trying to get out loans in, in uh, rural India, and they were getting different types of participation in different areas. So in some villages that they would go into, they would get almost no participation, and in other villages they would go into, they would get very large participation. And they were trying to understand the diffusion process, and they were working by word of mouth. And so information was spreading uh, via the networks. And so one question we had was, can we understand why they're having very different outcomes in otherwise very similar villages? And how did that depend on who they were informing and trying to get to spread the information in those villages? So I'll tell you a little bit about the data that we were working with. So um, there were 75 rural villages. Um, these are all in Karnataka, relatively isolated from microfinance initially. Um, one the, for a key point for the second part of this presentation is going to be that the bank entered 43 of these villages and did not enter the other 32. So eventually we'll be able to see how does the presence of these loans affect the, the social structures inside these villages. So they entered 43, they did not enter the other 32. And we um, measured the networks that in the villages before they entered and then again after they entered. And so we'll look at how these, um, how the presence of the bank affected the, the, the changes in the network structures. So they were offering loans. These were about 10,000 rupee loans, roughly $200 a day at the time, um, 50 weeks, high interest rates, um, about 30% or more. Uh, these loans were given to women, um, 18 to 50 years old and they were Grameen style. Um, so there was no collateral, but if you defaulted, you could not get a loan again. And, and these were put into groups of five to give incentives. So if anybody in your group defaulted, you were not allowed to get loans again. So here we are in Southern India, um, uh, Karnataka. So we were in about a hundred kilometer band around Bangalore. These, this will give you an idea of what the villages look like. So these are relatively poor villages, um, mostly uh, agriculture, some sericulture, um, you know, households, some of them have permanent roofs, some of them have thatched roofs. So we went into a village 
we would map out a network. So this is a network of borrowing and lending in one of the villages. So each little dot is a an adult. Um, they're grouped into households. So if you see a, a group together, those are all within the same household. And then this is um, if you need to borrow 50 rupees for a day, who would you go to to borrow? So so these villages are relatively poor. The per capita per capita income in those villages is about a dollar or two dollars a day. Uh, so we mapped out a, a 12 um, different networks. So there's the borrowing network, there's a temple network, there's um, an advice network. So who do you go to for important advice? Um, who comes to you to borrow kerosene or rice? Who would you go to in an emergency for medical help? So there's a whole series of different uh, of networks. And for the purposes today, we'll consider two households connected if they are connected in any one of these networks. Um, so, so think of a typical village as having about 200 households and each household being connected to about 15 other households. Um, these, we have a lot of demographics. So we have, a, we did a full census of the villages. So um, this is one of the villages, this is village 26. This is the kerosene and rice borrowing network. Now I'm just showing the households. So each node is a household and two of them are connected if they borrowed kerosene or rice from each other. And in particular, um, here uh, I've color coded them by caste. So the red are the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, the relatively disadvantaged castes in India. The gray are the um, general and otherwise backward castes. So the relatively advantaged castes. And here you can see uh, that there's a much higher frequency of connections within caste group than across caste groups. So here, uh, the chance that you're connected within um, these two different caste designations is about 9%. It's about 6 tenths of a percent if you go across. So you've got a 15 times higher likelihood of being connected inside. Okay, so, so that's the, some background on the, just the structure of this setting. And then the first question we asked in this research um, project was, do these initial points of injection matter and how should we measure what their position was in a village? And there's a lot of literature actually going back to Simmel in the early 1900s, um, suggesting that, you know, how you seed information in a society can make a big difference. And um, let us start just by thinking about what kinds of measures might be good for measuring whether somebody spreads information well. And the typical thing would be to use different centrality measures. Um, the most basic centrality measure would just be degree centrality. So we count uh, the number of connections that each person has and the person with the highest connections would be the best person for broadcasting news. Um, obviously that has deficiencies and has led to a lot of other design of, of centrality measures. Um, so here is a situation where we have two people who both have degree two, and obviously the person on the left is much better connected than the person on the right. Um, and, and so there are measures designed to connect the, uh, to capture this. So one measure that goes beyond just counting somebody's number of friends is trying to measure how well connected those friends are. So instead of just counting numbers, we count uh, how well they're connected. So the idea behind eigenvector centrality is that um, the centrality of a given individual is not just proportional to how many friends they have, but to the number of friends, uh, sorry, the, the centrality of those friends. So you sum up the centrality of all your friends. Um, so if, if the matrix uh, describing the network is G, um, so one, if I and J are connected and zero otherwise, then what we can look at is just an eigenvector calculation. So, so here, um, there's a well-defined first eigenvector of this, of a matrix, of a non-negative matrix um, by the perron fabrinius theorem. So we can identify eigenvector centrality via that eigenvector. And um, that gives a very different picture than degree. So here, these two nodes have the same degree, but the one in the center has um, th uh, three times as high 
eigenvector centrality is the other one. And now the, the highest uh, person in terms of the overall eigenvector centrality would be somebody who is um, uh, not the person with the highest degree in the network. Okay, so, so those were two things we thought about. Um, then we actually thought, well, look, if we're trying to measure spread of information, why don't we actually measure a diffusion process? And so we defined what we call diffusion centrality. And diffusion centrality is a notion actually now will be very familiar to people because of, of COVID. Um, it's basically built off of a, of a basic contagion model, um, like an SIR model. So the, the question here is, if we start with some particular person who we inform, then we'll have two parameters, a probability that they bump into any given friend in a period, and then some time period over which things will spread. And we can ask if there's just a random process and we inform somebody, how many people in the network do we expect to be informed within T periods if they're telling people with probability P in each period, okay? So just to make this concrete, let me just show you a picture of what would happen. So imagine that we set P to be 0.5, T to be four, then we have some node initially informed and you can go ahead then and just simulate things and say, okay, this person would um, inform on average half of their neighbors in any given period. So they happen to bump into somebody. Um, now this person's informed, the second period starts, this person can inform people um, the initial node can keep informing people. Then these, this, these people now are informed, they can inform people and so forth. So we go through and, um, you know, one simulation would give us a, a measure of 13 for this node, but you could just simulate this a bunch of times with these parameters. And that would give you an idea of how much information spread you would expect from this person, given this very simple um, contagion process. If you ran it from a different node, you go ahead, you run the same process, and what do you end up with? You would end up with six. So that would tell us that that first node would be, uh, if this was roughly the way that information spread, this first node would be twice as good as the other node at, at spreading information. Okay, now simulating this on networks, um, especially of large size, and doing it accurately can be a little bit time consuming. So another way to calculate this would just be to estimate it uh, via looking at walks in the network. So here, if we just take G to the teeth power and look at the IJ entry, that's the number of walks of, of length T between I and J. So that gives us an idea that information could spread from I to J in uh, T periods. And then um, if we hit that with P, that gives us the probability that things would go along this walk and then one estimation for diffusion centrality, the way that we estimated it, was just to sum up from one to T, this matrix raised to the teeth power, and then just sum all those things. So hit it with a one. Okay, so, so that's um, what we'll call diffusion centrality. And the interesting thing about this is if we, if we do this just in one period, this is going to be proportional to what your degree is. So somebody with higher degree is going to have a chance of spreading it to more friends if we did it for just t equals one. Um, if t goes to infinity, t becomes large, then diffusion centrality converges to eigenvector centrality. Uh, so, so one theorem you can prove here is if you have a connected aperiodic network, um, then if t is equal to one, diffusion centrality is just proportional to degree centrality. And if p is bigger than one over the first eigenvalue, then as T goes to infinity, diffusion centrality converges to eigenvector centrality. Um, if P turns out to be less than, than one over the first eigenvalue, um, then diffusion centrality is essentially in the limit becomes katz bonisich centrality. So, so here, the idea of, of this centrality measure is it spans a series of different centrality measures in the literature. And in an intermediate level, it captures things that are gonna spread but not spread infinitely. So it's not gonna have a chance to completely percolate through the network. Um, eigenvector centrality is sort of a limiting process where things are just completely moving forever through the network. Uh, diffusion centrality are ones where that process is eventually um, dying down. And the extreme version is it just has a chance to reach people's immediate friends. That would be degree centrality. Okay, so um, let me show you what, the, what, what happens empirically using this. 
So let's now say what we the this this bank was going into a given village. They were telling specific people, in particular, they were telling shopkeepers, self-help group leaders, and teachers um, about their loan program and saying, spread this to your friends. And we know who they talk to. And then we have the networks so we can measure the diffusion centrality of those people and see how well that predicts whether or not they, they got good participation in the loans or not. And so this um, chart is just looking at what's the percentage of microfinance participation that's explained if we just use village characteristics. So these are basically um, uh, looking at, at the uh, R squareds. Um, if we're just doing village characteristics, if we add in degree centrality, if we add in eigenvector centrality of, of these first people they talk to, or if we use diffusion centrality. And you can see that diffusion centrality explains a lot more of what's going on in terms of spread of information than just using degree or eigenvector centrality. So you get a lot more um, push from, from using diffusion centrality. And this is when we set T to be the diameter of the network and um, P to be one over the first eigenvalue. If you actually fit um, diffusion centrality to the data, you can get this up to about uh, a little more than 63% of the variation. So you can explain a lot of what's going on just by looking at this diffusion centrality of the individuals. Okay, so what does that tell us? That tells us that very specific uh, measures of what is going on in terms of a diffusion process can help us understand how the, uh, what the economic outcomes are in this village in terms of whether or not people are getting loans from a bank. Right, so the, the social structure is determining what the economic outcomes are in this village. So that's piece one of this puzzle. And now I want to go to piece two of the puzzle, which is which to ask, okay, now do these loans in turn come back and change the networks in the village? Right. So piece two is um, a, a question that, that Arrow famously asked in 1999. Um, does the market, or for, for that matter, the large efficient bureaucratic state? destroy social links that have positive implications for efficiency. So, so is it possible that the presence of the actual market then has a feedback effect on the, um, uh, on the networks themselves? Okay, so, so this um, is work that we're uh, just finishing now um, where it's a six author paper now. Um, including, so we've added Emily Braza and, and uh, Cynthia Kinnan to this. And what's happening here is in 2006, we had surveyed all these villages that the bank was going to enter. They ended up entering 43 of these villages and offering these loans. And then in 2011 and 12, we resurveyed all the villages. So we can see what the networks looked like before they entered. And then they entered some of the villages, but not all. And we can see what the villages um, look like afterwards. And the reason that they didn't enter all the villages is because of the financial crisis. So in 2009, 2010, they started having financial problems and they stopped entering villages and offering loans. Um, and so we'll, we'll compare the villages that they entered to the ones that they didn't. And um, so first of all, for this, we don't see any significant differences between the villages, but they were not randomized. So I'm also gonna tell you at the end about a second one where we've gone in and we did randomization into the villages so we can see, so we can have a controlled experiment where some villages get microfinance and some don't, and then we see what the effects are on the network structures in those villages. Okay, so here, 2006, we survey, 2007 to 10, they enter um, some of the villages, but not all. And then 2011 and 12, we see what the impact is on the networks. Okay, so um, here's the, the first. So let's look at the non-microfinance villages and compare them to the microfinance villages. And what we see is just looking at the density in the network. So what's the average probability of connection between villages, uh, two households? And before they enter, it's roughly 10% in both the microfinance and non-microfinance villages. And, and when we look at the post period, um, that's dropped down to a little bit above 8% in the uh, non-microfinance villages. So there was some deterioration in networks going on already, 
just um, because of the change in the uh, economies in, in this area of India. But now having the microfinance um, bumps that up, it basically doubles the drop in the size of the networks. So instead of a 15% drop, you get about a 30% drop in the, in the structure of these villages. Um, so the, there's a substantial drop in the, in the, in the network densities um, of almost a third in, in these microfinance villages and about a 15% drop in the villages that, the, that, that did not get loans. Okay, so um, then we started to try and figure out, well, what's actually going on? Why, why are we losing network um, links in these villages? Why is the network being affected? And the um, immediate thing one can think of is, well, people who are getting loans used to have to borrow from their friends, and now they no longer need to borrow money from their friends. And so that means you're going to see fewer borrowing and lending networks, uh, links between people who got loans and people who didn't. And so that could be one explanation of what's going on. So what we'd like to do, first of all, is just compare the people who got loans and, and see if they lost more um, of their network structure than people who didn't get loans. Okay, so what we'd like to do is compare um, participants across the microfinance villages and non-microfinance villages. And the thing is, it's pretty easy to see who participated in the microfinance village, but then it's hard to see who would have participated in the non-microfinance villages to compare them to, because the um, participation in these loans differs by the demographics. And so we'd like to match people up. And so we don't know who would have participated in the non-microfinance villages. So what we're gonna do is use propensity scoring, a standard propensity scoring technique to go ahead and do this. And we used a, a machine learning to do this. We used a random forest algorithm. So we did the um, propensity scoring by looking at, at different characteristics using a random forest algorithm and we were able to produce, so what we did is we broke people into high and low probabilities of participating in microfinance and um, conditional on being a high, then there's actually about a 46% chance that people participated. Conditional on being a low is about a 4%. So, so the, this does do pretty well at actually categorizing. So using machine learning here does a pretty good job at predicting who's going to take up microfinance. And then what we can do is we'll call these high people. So we can look at the highs in the microfinance villages compared to the non-microfinance villages and see what happens to their networks, okay? And so now if we look at the, the probability that the two households are connected, we can say, okay, if they're both highs, uh, what's, what's happening? And in the non-microfinance village, um, you find a higher probability than you are finding of the highs being linked in a microfinance village. So that's the, you know, the first part of the puzzle is yes, indeed, these people are no longer being connected to each other as much in the microfinance villages if they're people who are likely to get loans. Um, the interesting thing was that this, this drop tended to not just be among the highs, but pretty much across the board. So it seems that the, the deterioration was not just among the people who got loans, but also people who got loans to people who didn't and then the surprising thing to us was that people who didn't participate at all were also losing um, relationships. And so there was a deterioration in the um, structure of this network, not just from high to high and high to low, but also from low to low. So people who were very unlikely to be getting this, um, Get, get participating in the microfinance, we're also seeing this deterioration in their network structure. Okay, so um, what what accounts for this? It's actually, it's, it's inconsistent with a lot of network formation models. And these are significant, large and significant effects. So figuring out a model that actually fits this, um, it took us a little bit of time. And actually, uh, I think I, I was there in 2012 to, to visit some of the villages and talk to people and figure out more or less what was happening. And um, the, you know, the, the basic story behind what we think is happening was that um, it takes some effort to socialize. And in particular, in these villages, people would tend to go to a, a town square or they would tend to go to um, hang out to have tea with each other and so forth. And that socializing maintains the old relationships and helps form new relationships. That's where you meet people. And um, there's complementarities in this process. 
So if there are people who get loans and they no longer need to borrow and lend from each other and uh, they stop going, spending as much time socializing, and that has a, a deterioration effect in the whole um, village in the sense that not only they don't show up anymore, but now other people don't find it as useful to go and hang out anymore because nobody's doing that. And so then you see complementarities in this and it's very easy now to build a model where people are gonna choose efforts to socialize, they're gonna randomly meet people. And that means that um, there's complementarities. The more others socialize, the easier it is to meet them and maintain relationships. The, the less time they spend socializing, the, the harder it is. And um, <clears throat> one thing that's sort of interesting when you look at these villages is when you look at what's happening, you know, like in the borrowing and lending network, um, you're seeing actually this deterioration more about among the lows even than the highs because of this. So the lows uh, tend to be more affected by this. And interestingly, this means that there's also a multiplexing effect. So what happens is you don't only get this in the borrowing and lending network, but if you look at the advice network, you get very similar deterioration in the advice networks of both lows and highs from non-microfinance to microfinance villages. So the networks are being affected for the borrowing networks. They're being affected whether or not you're low or high, and it's also affecting other kinds of relationships that are completely non-financial relationships. So you end up, um, you know, this is a part, part of where the complexity is arising. You're, you're moving a market and you're seeing social structure impacted not only among the people directly impacting uh, in, in contact with the market, but also people indirectly um, in, in contact with them and in other types of relationships that have nothing to do with finance. Okay. So with all this done, we wanted to double check that this wasn't just due to um, you know, some strange difference in the villages that they were picking certain villages to enter and not. So we did a randomized controlled microfinance experiment in Hyderabad. And in uh, 104 villages, half of them got microfinance in starting in 2006, um, half didn't. So 52 did, 52 didn't. Um, we, we, again, we did uh, we look at network data um, and then compare the differences across these villages. Now that it's a randomly controlled trial, we can just see you know, what's the differences between these two villages. And you get extremely similar effects um, in sign and magnitude. So again, um, the villages that get microfinance see a greater deterioration or a, a substantially um, larger deterioration in the networks than in the villages who didn't. And in these villages, we were also able to go in and measure consumption and income. And so we can begin to see what kinds of effects are going on in terms of consumption and income and other impacts beyond this. And one thing we see there is that the lows see an increased correlation between consumption and income. So almost a two thirds increase in the correlation between their consumption and income. So, and it, it, you know, as economists, often we measure what's the variance in somebody's consumption and variance in consumption we think of as a bad thing. So if you're starving some days and then eating well next days, um, you'd rather be smoothing that over overall and have consumption be flat rather than having consumption spike up and down. And what happens here is, well, in the villages that got microfinance, you're seeing an increased variance in the consumption of the, the lows. And in particular, the correlation between their income and their consumption is going up. So it's they're less able to spread that consumption around. And it's more that they just are eating on days where their income happens to be high and um, not on days where it's, where it's low. And so uh, we see this in increased correlation among the lows, but not among the highs. And it, it's interesting, it's not that the, the lows income is changing, it's just that the variance of this. So the, the help of the network and spreading out and borrowing and lending and so forth is disappearing from the villages that got the microfinance. Um, so non-microfinance takers are less able to smooth income. Okay, so you know what are the, some of the lessons here on network formation? Um, I think that you know there's a couple of of important lessons. Uh, one is that there's basic complementarities and spillovers in these worlds. So microfinance participant 
participants' behavior affects others, even low, low relationships, so people who are not participating at all. So that there's uh, inter indirect effects. Then there's multiplexing effects. So these lending links are tied to advice links, which also are, are changing and, and so forth. Um, then I, I think, you know, in terms of implications for this, uh, you know, here we get exposure to formal loans um, are, are changing the social fabric. And that has unintended consequences. So the lows are losing relationships um, at even a higher rate than the highs. We're seeing increased income variance and we're seeing non-money relationships affected. So there's a lot of, of uh, indirect effects that are not part of the intention of this kind of program, which is generally put in in order to help people in these villages um, through, through access to credit. Um, it could increase inequality. And in fact, um, here we're seeing higher variance in, in uh, consumption for the lows. And so you're seeing it not only in, in increased inequality in the network, in the social fabric, but also in the economic fabric. And I think, you know, when we think about policy design and so forth, these kinds of things need to be taken into account. Um, so, you know, one caution on this, it's not to say that, that offering loans and getting credit into villages is a bad thing. It's just saying that in, in these kinds of complex systems, you start changing one part of a society and it's going to have wide ranging implications. And here what we're seeing is it's not just small second order effects, it's large effects. So you change you know, part of, of what's going on in the market and you end up having a, a fairly large impact on the social structure. So you know, these networks matter, they affect um, the formal markets, they affect a lot of other things. Uh, that, that's part of, I think, what, what's fascinating about studying them. Um, formal markets and institutions are intertwined with these informal networks. And so we're getting feedback and, and dynamics. Um, and then let, let me say a couple of other things just in closing. So, you know, here we've been looking at um, what's going on in a world where these are fairly isolated villages. Um, the, the structure that's coming in is a formal market in the form of loans, but the, you know, general developed world is also being affected by changes in markets. And what's happening now for, for us, um, technology is increasingly mediating more of our interactions. So more and more interactions are happening on platforms. Those platforms have consequences in terms of who they connect and how they connect us. And I think we need better understanding of the overall feedbacks of these things because it's pretty clear that these have wide ranging effects. And just to give you one graph, which I, th I find pretty amazing, um, this is from a, a study by some sociologists, Mark Rosenfeld and others. And this is just looking at, at you're looking at couples in the United States and they have a, um, a time series. This is just looking at the heterosexual couples and what they were looking at is how they first met. And, um, you know, over time, so from the 1940s to 2020. And the interesting thing is you're seeing a completely different um, set of dynamics. So via friends, family, school, these things are, are decreasing over time. Uh, what you are seeing is that increasingly people are meeting online and online means through some sort of platform where their first connection to each other is actually mediated by that platform. Um, actually bars are increasing as well, but I think that's partly because of the online, uh, there's apps that people can use and things. But I think, you know, in, in going back to these thoughts, um, you know, technology is mediating our interactions as well. So it's not just markets that are impacting things, but we have a whole series of things that are impacting how people are, are what their incentives are for meeting each other and how they're meeting each other. And I think we need a much better understanding of the dynamics of how these different settings uh, affect um, network formation. So that should be a great time to um, stop and ask for questions. Um, Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Uh, very interesting. Very interesting. And uh, in a different field that uh, several people are here. So it was, uh, I'm sure there are several questions. And uh, I can read them off, some of them at least, uh, that are written in the, in the chat. Um, is this simplification of works that the works might be cyclic, but diffusion centrality are not? Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, you know, the, the fusion centrality original one is one where things, you know, just hit a person once and come 
along some direct path, but with walks, it could be that things are cycling around and so forth. And I think that's a good empirical question. So whether or not information actually cycles so that I hear something from a friend multiple times and then pass, do I pass it on more or not? Um, so I, I, I actually don't know whether which one of those models is slightly is a better one, whether just doing a simulation where people are informed and once they're informed, that's it and they keep spreading information or whether information can cycle. So the way we're calculating diffusion centrality allows for cycles. Um, but I think that's a, it's a good question and I don't know empirically whether that, that's actually accurate or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another point is uh, the crisis of 2009. Have you modeled uh, the effects in the ability to lend money then? And how did the crisis affect the life in these villages? Yeah, so the um, 2009, uh, so what we do know is that, that 2009 did affect um, some of the borrowing and lending in the villages overall. So we see overall a depression in uh, both the network structure and some changes in the overall borrowing. It's hard to know whether that's just due to, you know, India was undergoing a fairly large transformation in Karnataka during that time period where there was um, increasing uh, migration from people from the villages into places like Bangalore. It's it's a growing tech sector in India, so there's a lot of changes going on in that area. Um, so it's hard to know how much of it was due to the crisis and so forth. So we don't know exactly um, all the different things that were happening, and that's part of the reason we had to have controls of the non-microfinance compared to the microfinance villages in, in both of the studies so that we can see what, what's happening differently from the microfinance from just all these other trends that are going on. And so I, I, I actually don't know whether how much the crisis was at work compared to just the general trends there, but there was a, a general deterioration in the networks and um, there was increased uh, borrowing in, in most of the settings we were looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, a similar question is, is there a way to discriminate that these network dynamics are due to exogenous factors? Uh, for example, again, this crisis in 2009, could that have been the effect? Yeah, exactly. So, so that's part of the reason that we have controls. So we have villages that, that we, we look at exactly the same time period and we have the villages- control groups, that, yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, and so, so through those control villages, that's the way we're able to separate how much is happening from the presence of the loans and microfinance compared to all the other things in the background. But it's it's hard to know what exogenous factors mattered, but we can control for those by having the you know the villages that got microfinance compared to the ones that don't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, there's so many questions here. <laughs> Let me see how many I can have time to read. Along with the loss of connection in uh, societies of microfinance, have you examined whether there has been a decrease in connections between different castes over time? Um, yeah. So. Uh, so there's interesting effects in caste. So overall, it doesn't look like there's much of a, a change in caste groups. But one thing that is interesting is you do see some increase. So one thing, one side effect of this is the, um, the loans are actually given to groups of women. So um, a women, five women will be put into a group and all five of them get a loan at the same time. And they actually have to meet every two weeks. And so they form friendships and that, and they're mixed across caste groups. So you actually see some new ties formed from the loans um, across caste groups, but then you see deterioration um, among the networks everywhere else. So there's, you know, there's sort of competing effects of the loans bring some people together, but are sort of um, diminishing the connections overall. Okay. So there's, there's com competing effects on that. I think I can read, I have time for one more question. Is the quantity of goods in one place of the net equal to the same quantity to another place of the net at the time? Um, uh, so I guess in, in goods, I'm not, I'm not sure what's meant by goods, but effectively when we do look, you know, we can look at consumption and so forth and the, the consumption overall tends to be similar in terms of average levels. But what we are seeing is an increase in variance in these in the in the villages that got in the microfinance. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. Well, there's so many questions, but we have uh, run out of time. I remind you that at the end of the session and the next session of the parallel session, there is a break for half an hour later in the uh, evening for you in the middle of the day that uh, people can get together and uh, discuss uh, things there. So thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, we can uh, stop sharing now.
Um, and uh, we are now ready to go to the special events.